Welcome to the Watkins Podcast. We are a United Methodist Church located in Louisville, Kentucky. On this podcast, you'll hear a selection of messages, interviews, and more with one of our pastors. If you're ever around the area, please be sure to stop by and say hi, or visit our website at watkinsumc.com. Now, I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. We're going to talk about the widow's mite today. And um, I, I hope that together we'll be able to, to understand a little bit about the context of it. If you want to follow in context along, we'll be, be in Mark chapters uh, 11 and 12. Uh, but in the, the end of chapter 12, uh, the story goes like this. Jesus went over to the collection box in the temple and sat and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two pennies. He called his disciples to him and he said, I assure you, this poor widow has given more than all the others have given, for they give a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything that she has. There was a time uh, when I worked with a lot of youth workers in town, um, and as, as we began this, this ministry, and I would go visit them in their churches, and I would get to know folks that worked in those churches during the day. And there was a church in Crestwood that I went, and I had a buddy of mine that was a youth minister there, and their receptionist, her name was Florence. Florence was an older woman, very quiet, and she answered the phone and took notes and and those kinds of things, and she sat out in this this entryway of the church every day, and so when I would wait or get early to my meeting or whatever, I would hang out with Florence and get to know her. And one day I came in and Florence was crying. And I was kind of taken back by that. And I had known a little bit about, about Florence and her passion for missions. Uh, years and years ago, she had a chance to be uh, on the mission field and dreamed of going back. That didn't happen. But at night, every night, she would collect sheets Uh, bed sheets, and she would put them in strips. And she had a little machine that she told me about. I was always checking with her to see how many many rolls of bandages that she made with that little machine. So she sat there while she watched television or or listened to music, and she would wind those bandages up, and she would box those up. And when the box was full, she'd close it, and she'd tape it, and she'd address it, and she'd take it to the post office. And she had a missionary group in Brazil that she would send these uh, bandages to that were doing medical work. She was very, 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 very involved in, in that and very passionate about that work. Well, today she was crying, and I was assuming something terrible had happened, and, um, but she was weeping with thankfulness. And she said, I pray over every box that goes out. All of the bandages, I pray that they can be used uh, to serve and help people uh, that are hurting in this community. Uh, with the medical missionaries. She said, one of my boxes got caught in customs, so I prayed for it. It was two years, but this week I found out that the box had been released and they got their bandages. I thought, oh my gosh, what a great story that someone would pay attention uh, to something uh, that small and perhaps we would think some of us sometimes insignificant, but for Florence, it was a very, very important uh, thing uh, for her to be Uh, involved in and pray about, and if you will, kind of unleashed in this ministry of her own very quietly in her home every night. She reminded me of of this widow. You know, the story um, comes to us in the middle of this great turmoil in these couple of chapters. And Mark, uh, Jesus has has come back to Jerusalem for Passover. Um, He's uh, daily walking towards the cross, if you will, and there's this angst that's happening between him and the, the Levites in the community. So the Levites are the group of guys that are responsible for the synagogue. So they're high priest, priest, and then all the helpers. So there's musicians that they have. There's folks that guard the doors. Um, there are lawyers and judges that take care of all sorts of legal issues with the community there in the synagogue. So they take care of all types of of roles and responsibilities there. And Jesus, one day, if you'll recall, comes into the temple. He makes a little whip. And that story, we're not going to get on that story, but it always amazes me, like how angry do you have to be to stop 
and make a whip to beat people with. So, I mean, you got to be really angry. So Jesus got angry. He throws the tables over. He swinging the hip, can, uh, the whip. Can you imagine? Maybe he's using his hip a little bit, but he's swinging that whip and he's causing all kinds of chaos. And he's, he's, he's very upset. Reality is what the Levites had done is they kind of come into some, some common practices that really weren't good. They weren't what Moses had desi designed with God and teaching the people of what the law was. The Levites were there to help the folks out. They were never to profit for anything at all that they did for the community. Well, they were doing all kinds of little stuff. So they were kind of uh, looking down with contempt, if you will, on some of the offerings that people would give. And that was happening that day when Jesus got all upset in the temple. So um, maybe someone would come in with a, a dove, you know, as a little offering. They'd say, mm, <laughs> that dove's not good enough for God. That's a skinny old thing. I'll tell you what, I've got one over here. Let me sell you this one. And uh, I'll take yours. I'll sell you this one and God will be happier. There was all kinds of this money exchange in hands that was not supposed to be there, and they would use that money uh, for themselves. Moses and God came up with the law, and the law was that the Levites would only use money to help what's going on in the, in the synagogue and to support widows and orphans. That was what the money was supposed to be used for. But they were con these practices were, were good. They were charged for prayers. Can you imagine that? I need prayer. Well, about 10 bucks, and uh, I'll be taking care of that for you. They would uh, take uh, uh, widows, and when, their, when they, their husbands died, they would be uh, taking care of their estate, and they would kind of finagle that so that they would get money from that, and the widow would get less. And Jesus, just a couple of verses prior to the story that we read, looks at these Levites. Remember, he's been hanging out with them. He stormed through the temple. There's all this angst now. They're acting that he did that. He's caused such chaos. And, and there's these conversations going back and forth. He's telling stories in these, these, these parts of, of, of the scripture. And he says, you are stealing the homes of these women, these widows, and that's not right. Well, this kind of uh, is, is an interesting um, uh, point that, that, that we're at uh, when he tells the, the disciples that they are um, devouring these uh, widows, these homes of these widows, and in reality, their job is for, for they're forbidden for taking money for anything, and they come to prey uh, on these, these ladies uh, in their uh, synagogue. There's a widow, and her name is Shanti Solomon. She's in India, or was in India. She grew up uh, through World War I, and um, she, her family was Hindu. Her husband, or her father, I'm sorry, and her family became Christian uh, through some Presbyterian ministers. As a Hindu, her father becoming Christian uh, was looked down upon with the rest of the family. And they actually slaughtered her father in front of her as a child because that was punishment for him being a, a, a Christian. So Shanti ended up being raised by Presbyterian uh, missionaries and in a mission and uh, eventually grew up. She got married and lo and behold, she married a man that got very sick and had a long illness and she had to take care of him and, and he died. So she became a widow. Now, Shanti knew what it was like to be among hard times. Uh, she knew uh, hunger. She knew devastation. She knew loss. And uh, in um, all the midst of that, uh, she stayed close to the church. And at one point after World War I, the Presbyterian Church had a vision. They began to wonder about all of these c countries that had been in battle in World War I and how could the Presbyterian Church help those folks begin to imagine peace and reconciliation in the church. So they decided to have a conference, and they did it in Tokyo. And lo and behold, Shanti Solomon was the one woman in India that was invited to go to Tokyo to this conference, where people from all over the world, women from all over the world, would gather and imagine how they could 
build an, uh, a plan in prayer uh, for hope after World War II. She got to Tokyo. She went to the conference, and there was a lot of reasons why, but she couldn't go into the room. So she stayed outside the room, and she prayed. And during the conference, she was alone in prayer. She wasn't allowed to go inside the room. And over time, in that prayer, she came across this passage that just kept, God kept impressing on her of the, of the widow's might and these two small coins. Now, these two tiny coins that the widow gave um, are about, uh, uh, it was called, uh, uh, I'm going to have to look back because I forgot the word and I promised myself I wouldn't forget it. Um, it's called a lepta, and it is one one hundredth of a denarii. When you're like, well, what, what are you talking about? Well, the, a denarii is one day's wage. So she had two of those, and two of those represents a handful of flour, which actually represents a meal. So out of the flour, you could make a pita bread or a tortilla kind of thing, you know, to have a, a, a meal with. So that's what the widow gave that day in the offering. So Shanti was all consumed about this, and she thought these are the tiniest coins, the smallest coins of the time. I wonder what it would be like in our prayer for peace and reconciliation that all of the women around the world would give their tiniest coin to this effort as a symbol of humble prayer. So as the meetings continued on, Shanti was able to be a, uh, meet with some of the ladies, and she came up with this. They came up with this idea from from her leadership, and they decided, you know, the number twelve, I guess, for the twelve apostles, um, that they would commit to giving twelve coins of the the least coin from the country that everybody was from. They would go into a pot, and in that, that would instigate this this idea of prayer. It's called the Fellowship today. It's called the Fellowship of the Least Coin. It's still going strong. They raise millions of dollars. And it's a group of ladies that are all about prayer and reconciliation and comfort um, through the initial uh, experience of trying to, to provide hope after World War II. All because this widow, Shanti Solomon, uh, came in, uh, to this conference. Now, Shanti's traveled the world. She ended up with two college degrees. Now, she traveled with hardly anything. One time she traveled the world and started out with only $5. Crazy talk. But she was an amazing, amazing woman. And she's, you know, this is kind of where I want to kind of set up our uh, context uh, for the story. One of the things that gets me about this story is I kind of wonder where, where Jesus was going physically uh, in the story. So the story begins and tells us that Jesus was in the outer court of uh, the temple. So that's kind of a hangout spot. You know, maybe we could talk about that as the narthex. Everybody's kind of coming around, they're hanging out, they're chatting, and Jesus, again, is in the midst of this mess with the Levites. They're constantly challenging him and going back and forth. And remember, he challenged them about uh, how they were taking advantage of widows and that kind of thing. And then it tells us that Jesus went into this other court uh, where the offering was taken uh, in the temple, the treasury, or the court of women. Now, that's not like going from here to the narthex. To get there, you've got to go through another couple of big rooms. You know, you got to go deeper in, and now you're in this big room, um, this court. Over here is the treasury. And in the treasury, <clears throat> when they took offerings, there were 13 uh, large um, containers. And when you came to bring your offering, you put your offering in one of those 13 containers. And containers were for special offerings kind of thing and, and special projects and that kind of thing, kind of like we do today. And then there were containers just for general donations. So for some reason, Jesus is out here in the outer court uh, and all this turmoil is going on. And he goes into the one of the inner courts for where the women are, but men can hang out there too, of course. And then we've got the treasury over here. Well, assumingly, for me, as I read the story, I'm thinking, well, some of those Levites followed him in there, and there's a little entourage. And so he decides to sit and watch as people are giving their offerings, their tithes and offerings. <clears throat> I don't know, maybe he saw this lady earlier coming in. Um, I don't know. Or maybe he just was trying to look for an opportunity to make another point to these folks. But certainly this woman widow, um, uh, Jesus 
talks about her being extremely poor. She was probably dressed poor, uh, probably had been taken advantage of by the Levites, probably knew that only these two tiny coins would be seen as contempt or seen with contempt, but it's all she had. So she brought these coins and dropped them into the offering. And Jesus said to those that were around him, this woman has just given her life. The powerful, powerful image. He comments on the wealthy people that are around, giving their tithes and offerings. And in the verbiage used there, he says the folks of wealth are giving out of their surplus. Doesn't really matter to them what goes in. They can afford it. Doesn't hurt them. Doesn't cause uh, any angst at all. But she's given everything she's got. Her last meal, so to speak. That comparison, I think, um, is pretty powerful. And one that I uh, hope, um, I'm sure he hoped, and, and, and we hope today isn't lost on us. It wasn't lost at, you know, on the Levites that... Um, that um, um, we're listening. I'm reminded, if, if you recall, there's a point uh, in the Old Testament when King David um, is, um, uh, there's a story he's being offered uh, some property uh, by a gentleman uh, uh, in thanks, and, and David says, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take your gift because it didn't cost me anything. He said, I'm gonna pay for it. And he said, because I don't want to give God anything that doesn't cost me something. I don't know about you, but that changes, that changes my idea of my gifts in the offering uh, plate. The, um, you know, back, back to uh, this, this idea, I think there's two elements that, um, that we can draw out of this passage. One is that the heart of the widow is, is what Jesus, I think, is looking at. It's not that she kind of gave her last, just that she gave her last meal uh, in the offering, um, and that was a, a wonderful thing, and she, she risked giving that last meal, knowing that, that hardship is around the corner, but she's also a, a product of a broken system. So she's been manipulated by this system, by these Levites, that bring, she comes to this offering because she loves God and she wants to give to uh, the church, might we say today. Uh, and she gives, she knows that they're going to think it's nothing, but she gives in the hopes that God might recognize that, that it would be something. I got to wondering, if you look at Florence, if you look at Shanti Solomon, you know, what, 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 what would he be like? If you could imagine this, this, the heart of this widow, this woman, uh, what would it be like if um, she could be empowered with her heart versus living in a system that takes from her and shames her? See, what I guess I want to encourage you guys today is that from this holy place, this room, you've done that. This is what you do. As you have, over these years, um, been able to spawn this wonderful opportunity to empower people uh, to do great things, empower the folks to, to give. Waterstep does this shoe drive, and some of you came up. You came up to me earlier and said, "I walked out of the house, and the box was sitting right there, and I didn't bring them in. I got to bring those." Well, the nice thing is we take shoes every day, so you're in good shape. But this idea of the shoes kind of uh, resonates with me uh, with this story to a bit. Folks in the United States have dozens and dozens of shoes. Um, we've done studies, and and there's. Shoes, we have tons of shoes. Shoes, used shoes, are a top 10 export for the United States around the world. Pretty crazy. Did you ever know that? Goodwill makes most of their money off used shoes. They export those. Well, we export those, and we get 20,000 pounds plus a month, and 
you guys have been wonderful. Some of you guys have come in and y'all sorted shoes uh, at Waterstep with us, and you've done many shoe drives, which is exciting. Um, three shoes provides enough money, maybe two, two small pennies in some, some countries, but it provides enough money for Waterstep to provide safe water for one person for the rest of their lives. Do you say, wow, how about that? Three pair of shoes donated, we'll sell them to an exporter. He sells them around the world. Some little mom and pop marketplace group or couple with a tent and a blanket might buy those shoes to sell. And those sh shoes might be affordable to someone living in poverty to put on their kids. It's a great cycle. We save all this out of the landfill. But for us, the power is those three pair of shoes will provide water for one person for life. It doesn't take a lot. Empowerment, I think, is, is something that is underlying uh, with this story. You know, I think Jesus is saying, you know, the way Moses and God set up the law is that you would get money to empower you uh, to be able to help widows and orphans to empower them to raise their lives up. Doesn't that seem like an obvious thing that, that may have been going on there? And what happened is the priests, the Levites, decided that they would come up with some other ways to manipulate that process and make money for themselves. Not so good. Quick empowerment story. Humphrey Machuma is a man that lives in Kenya. And he had a friend that asked him to go visit a friend at a prison in Kenya. Humphrey's been working with us for 10 plus years. He's an amazing man. Uh, when you sit with Humphrey and you say, um, Humphrey, do you have a job? He's like, no, but I'm an I'm ambassador at Waterstep. We don't pay him, but Humphrey and his family pray uh, that they will be provided food and what they need. And Humphrey travels around and does water projects. He's an amazing man. But this particular day, a friend asked him to go see a friend at a prison. And I don't know if you can imagine prison. If you've ever been in prison here, it's kind of a poopy diaper place to be. But if you're in another country, it's really literally poopy diaper. No sanitation, no safe water, horrific environment. Everybody's sick. They're passing these horrible diseases back and forth to each other. Water bone illness is rampant. The guards are sick. It's a terrible place, unclean. So Humphrey goes to see his friend's friend there. Well, after a little while, Humphrey got, is like, man, I could do something here. I can help these folks out. They can have a better environment. So he says, would you like some safe water? Can, would you like to learn how to make your own disinfectant? They couldn't even sleep on the pads that they had for, uh, at night because they were full of bed bugs. So they just slept on the ground or the concrete. It was just terrible, and they were sick all the time. So Humphrey comes in, transforms the prison, helps them, empowers them to transform the prison. All of a sudden, it smells like disinfectant. Everything's clean. People are healthier. Oh, my gosh. And the prisons nearby are like, I think we want some of that. It's about 130 prisons, men and women's prisons in Kenya. We've done over 70 now with safe water and sanitation. The interesting thing about women's prisons are often women are in there as widows. And in prison, if you don't have anybody taking care of your kid out here, you got to bring your kid to prison. So a lot of times the ladies are living with their children there. And then when they get out, nothing. What's different out there after you've served your sentence? And some of them are simply arrested for, for doing things that they're trying to keep their family alive. So Humphrey think, hmm, how could we empower these women and men in prison better? So we have a tool that makes bleach. Bleach is uh, disaffected. Is, is something nobody in most of the developing world can even imagine affording. It's so expensive, but they can make bleach themselves with a little bit of salt and a 12-volt battery. And so now what Humphrey does is he has business classes in the prisons where the ladies are taught how to start a small business 
making bleach, selling it in the market. The community's got bleach out here. They're making money, as much money as a, as a teacher at a school. A friend of mine, Scott Hayner, went to Kenya and happened to hang out with Humphrey, and, and uh, a woman showed up uh, at, at their meeting, and she had a dress on and some heels, and she walked in, and uh, Scott was introduced to her, and she was one of these ladies that had started her business. And uh, she said, do you like my dress? And Scott says, I do. She says, it's new. And she said, I also bought these shoes. I think they go together quite smartly. So this woman had an opportunity to be empowered. She helps the community have affordable disinfectant that changes their lives and gives them better health. She can financially take care of her family and everything changes. And so this perhaps is the vision that was the possibility in the synagogue that Jesus was kind of pointing out to the Levites, you missed the point. You're taking advantage of folks just because it's convenient when you could actually be empowering them to be more. And heart, the heart of Florence, the heart of Shanti Solomon, the heart of this woman in Kenya, the heart of this little lady that gave her last meal into the offering, what could you do with a heart like that? Church, you did that. Over 30 years ago, you started something that is empowering the hearts of folks like that around the world. And he empowered my heart. When I came here, I was on the verge of losing just about everything. And he gave me a chance. And we got to do something amazing together. And God worked in a way that amazes me to this day. But this, this is home. This is where it started for me. So I look back. And I told you about that experience where I was in West Africa and God showed me all this stuff and broke me apart, shattered my life. That was a life-changing moment. In this holy place was a life-changing moment. And for many of us, the young people that were with us 30, almost 35 years ago now, many of them are in healthcare, they're counseling folks, they're uh, um, in prison ministry, they're, they're doing all sorts of things because you've been able to recognize a heart to build up instead of one that might be left behind. I just want to thank you so much for, um, for what you've done and are doing. And the shoes, or there's just a nice reminder of a, of a widow's might, I think. We'll do something with those. But the lives they save that's the real purpose. And I just hope and pray as we continue our life together in this journey, and as we get older, as you get older, as we get older, God might surprise us more and more. Because to be honest with you, I don't know what could happen because my mind has been blown for many, many years now, watching how God has launched this thing from this place. I hope and pray that you and I may look for um, widows and orphans and those that have heart that we could raise up and empower. <laughs>